Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Stephen of Patty's Potato Peelers channel. Stephen hails from Northern Ireland and exhibits all the signs of a full-blown knife junkie. His channel features thematic videos covering every aspect of his amazing collection of slip joints, as well as other knives I've noticed recently. And now Stephen hosts a conversational show called Patty and Pals Podcast for a deeper dive on the subject. We've talked in virtual person before on Thursday Night Knives, but I am really looking forward to hunkering down and getting to the bottom of what motivates his love of folding knives. But before we do, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell and download the show to your favorite podcast app. And as always, if you would like to support the show, you can always do so by going to Patreon. Quickest way to get there is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase, and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long-sleeve tee, and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle, and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a Knife Junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at thenifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your Knife Junkie's merchandise at the knifejunkie.com slash shop. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really, really happy to be here. And I didn't even say hello to Jim. I was engrossed in listening to his voice live. Uh -huh. uh, Jim, I'm very sorry for being so rude. Nice to talk <laughs> to you in person. Oh, well, cool. I, I'm sure he was, uh, he's happy to hear that. Jim's the man, and he keeps the lights on here for oh, sure. He's amazing. So, Patty, before we get uh, rolling into our conversation, I got to know about the name of your channel, Patty's Potato Peelers. Where did that come from? It came from me, my wife, and I think there was one or two of my daughters sitting in the front room. And uh, I said I was starting a, a YouTube channel, um, which was a bit of a hilarious sort of subject to them. I couldn't understand why, but... Um, Anyway, it just came into my head, and I thought, what about Paddy's potato peelers? And they just burst into tears of laughter, and I thought, right, that'll do. I, you know, I think it was, as, it was as simple. It was so simple, it's even really hard to remember. It just came out, and it stuck. It's that alliteration, you know, the three Ps. Everyone loves yeah. that. <laughs> and, and I mean, I still get it now. When you do the GEC, if you collect GECs, you've got the PPP, the Paddy's Premier, but, you know, it just... I get the Mickey taken out quite a lot, especially from uh, what do you call the old fella? Oh, he old uh, he used to do an awful lot of GEC. He does a he sells knives every week. What do you call him? Oh, oh his uh, name. Uh, uh, you're talking about Rob Bixby. Oh, Rob Bixby, yes. Sorry, how can you forget his name? <laughs> Apostle P. <laughs> Apostle P. Every time he he un unveils a knife with PPP, he always says Paris potato peelers, which <laughs> is my complete claim to fame. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So, well, you're in Ireland, as I mentioned, that's where you hail from. What's it like collecting knives in Ireland? Is it, is it a uh, permissive environment? Um, <laughs> it is more complicated than most countries because we're a nanny state. If you, if, you know, anybody who talks about knives, that's not, you know, for cutting your dinner, there seems to be this fear in knives. Now, Granted, in the UK, and I think a lot of places in the world now, there's an awful lot of stabbings going on with youngsters and teenagers. And I can accept why some people would get frightened if you're living in a bad district and that there. But you know, I lived in Northern Ireland through the trouble. So, I mean, I don't quite see it. I don't think the knife is not the problem. It's the people are the problem. But it's a very hard concept to get across to people who don't believe they've got a problem. And I, I think that's the main part of it. It's that fear factor. And then the government making things more and more complicated to collect knives or buy knives, to carry knives. And it just all becomes, it's got to the stage now where it's gone on so long, the chances of changing, I believe, are next to nothing. Unless something 
radical comes out, I can't think of any way you would change it. Um, so we're restricted to knives under three inches that are non-locking. Now, this is the very strange thing. You can have knives, you can have locking knives uh, that are over three inches as long as you don't take them out of your house, which I can never understand why that is going to help somebody who's going to use one of his knives to take it out. I mean, the kids take a kitchen knife out. They don't take a 400 pounds of benzo right. out to go and stab somebody. Uh, but it has got to the stage now where I've got over the anger of it. I've got over the disappointment of what, and you just have to accept wherever it is. If it's a law, it's a law. You yep. just have to accept it. And you yeah, can moan all you like, and it doesn't change. Well, you gotta you gotta be aware of the waters you're swimming in, and know why yeah. they're like that. You know, even even here in the states, um, you know, we are a permissive environment for knives. Uh, you know, more or less, depending on where yeah. you are. Uh, but still, there's a there's a media that works on our fear here, and uh, yeah, they'd love to get knives as a part of that. You know, part of the gun conversation, that kind of thing. But um, but I I've been getting knives in the hands of people I work with. I, I'm doing my part to to uh, reduce that fear around here. I've never seen a knife jump out of uh, out of the drawer and, and hurt someone, so. I've never seen a knife fight. <laughs> no, no. And I, I grew up at the time when there was riots on the street, soldiers going up and down and armored cars up the street, never seen a knife fight. So yeah, it's not a very big place, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's somebody sits in a wee desk and has nothing to do for the rest of the afternoon, comes up with a solution to a, Problem that was never there. So do you have um, compatriots around you who collect knives as well? Is there a community there? Yeah, it's growing. And this is the wonderful thing about it. And it's it's only started growing since I went back to slip joints. And I, I, I seem to have gathered this sort of half a dozen uh, to 10 people in the north of Ireland itself. And I've met a few of them now, which is an unreal experience, is meeting somebody that's on YouTube. Uh, so I've met them. I'm very close friends with a fellow who I do a podcast with. Mm -hmm. He's uh, He just lives about 10 minutes away. Um, so me and him spend a couple of afternoons a week or a couple of hours in an evening, you know, and we just sit and talk knives. And it's like, do you know, it's like giving a junkie a big pile of coke and say, go and have fun. It's on us. And that's exactly that feeling. And I'm not making fun of that. I'm an addict myself, but it, it is. It's that feeling that you get of, Oh, this is amazing um, because I love talking about knives like all of us. Yeah. You know, it's interesting uh, that you say that because I've met a lot of people in the knife world who um, for whom knives have been a remedy to some of the some of the more addictive issues they may have had in the yeah. in the past. Excuse me. And, um, you know, I'm sure I could count myself among them in one way or another. You know, it, yeah. uh, just the 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 enthusiasm of the people that you meet who are also into it. It's so wholesome. You know, even though they're yeah. knives, it's so wholesome and it, it pulls you down a, a positive road. It really, really does, especially for me. And I, I've, I you know, I'm go, what am I about 34 years sober now. Uh, and I've also wow. gone through the death of my son with suicide. And I mean, getting over alcohol was one thing. My son it was a completely different thing. I went into uh, places I never thought I could ever get to. But you see, when I found knives, it was the first time in years that I actually had something where I could talk about and I didn't have to think. And that has been exactly this way for six years now. I do believe it gave me uh, something that I could get other things out of my head. I could just concentrate on that for a podcast or a video I'm watching. And it was amazing in the beginning, the release that can give you. So, yeah. The, very much and we all have i'm not saying mine to be terrible but i think we all have little demons somewhere and when you find something yeah. that eradicates them demons and keeps you in a healthy place it's perfect so for Hang you for you what what is it about have you thought about dissected what it is exactly about knives um that has a grip on you um, have I thought if I thought <laughs> it wouldn't cost me a fortune if I find that that secret and I just haven't found it. I don't think there is a secret. I think it's one of them things like any hobby, like cars or whatever you get into. Once it's in your head and you, you feel the the pet the pleasure and the pain of being a knife collector and being a YouTuber, and it gives you I don't know, it, it takes you away from 
the world. Like when I played golf for three hours, I walked down the golf course. All I thought about was golf. With my knives, I can come in and have 10 minutes here and there. I can have an hour. It's not so, I don't have to dress up to go out in the rain. I just sit in my wee room and I can be quite happy with a pile of knives in front of me. Um, thinking of topics for videos. You know, I, I, I've i thought about this recently. I, I'll come home from work sometimes. I noticed this on Thursdays before my live show where I'll be riled up about whatever I've been listening to in the news. And, and I'll think, you know, it, it'll be heavy on my mind. And then once the show starts, all of that goes away. You know, sometimes yeah. I'm like, oh, geez, I, I need to talk about this or that. And I'm like, no, I don't. That's people are not <laughs> tuning in to hear about that. They're tuning in yeah. to not hear about that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it really is. Uh, and it's, it, it's such a simple concept is you buy a knife, you you test it, you carry it, or do whatever you want to do with a knife, um, and then you buy another one. <laughs> there's, there's no great complicated secret. That's the way it is. You buy a knife. Like I bought a a, a beautiful Sabenza the other week. Uh, it's one I've wanted for ages, and it's a real – I'm not going to say grail because I've only got one grail. I keep saying that. But it's one of the – it's my highest-end knife that I've got, and I adore it. And I've spent the last – two weeks, trying to think of things bad I could say about the knife because everybody says they're wonderful or everybody says they're rubbish. <laughs> it's so difficult sometimes to find a different angle to come to review a knife. Um, I don't do a whole lot of notes. I do My my thinking is sitting with a knife in front of me, having a look at after use, having a look at it, and just what do I get out of that knife? And I would rather find the good things than the bad things. Because if the, if the things are that bad, I wouldn't have it on my channel to start with. Do you know what I mean? I would just yeah. get pass it on and get a knife that I can say good things. Because there's an awful lot of people out there, designers, makers, that's their living. And I don't feel that I really need to get into lambasting something just for the, the case of it. Now, that's just me. Uh, plenty of people do it. And I watch their channels. I love the way they do it. People have a lovely way of doing it sometimes. And it, but it's just not my form. I, I I want this to be my happy space. Yeah, yeah, and right. I, I I agree. It's it's only every once in a while is do I feel like it's valid to bring up the, yeah. the real negatives of something. You know, if something's dangerous, of course you have to mention Very that. Very much. Um, but I, I like um, this is happening a little bit more and more uh, for me now. But I know with other you know big YouTubers. Uh, uh, people will send them knives for advice. Okay, here's my prototype. What should I change? And uh, I like the idea of that sort of private connection and that private, yeah. well, in my opinion, this, this, and this. And then you can aggregate all of that data and then make your fixes without having it be a big public spectacle. Uh, yeah, I sort of get, but you're a, you're a bit of a knife maker as well, Bob. You make a knife. I, you know, I think the joy of making a knife is making the mistakes before you get to what you actually think is a knife to show somebody. And in your head, you've got a good knife. You just want it confirmed. I, you know, should I be the one to say, you know, oh, if that was a millimeter better, it would just make mm -hmm. your knife perfect. That would drive me insane. <laughs> just, I'd rather I'd rather put it out and have it flop. Do you know what I mean? But Yeah, yeah. I, it, everybody's different. Look, that's what's so lovely. This knife world is just fast. I mean, I've gone through so many ups, downs, arguments. I have a big mouth. I get myself in trouble lots of times. I just, it's just me. That That is, you get the real person, if you know what I mean. Right. But most of the time, when I have knives in front of me, I'm happy. I'm joyous. I get a new one. Should it be £10 or £400? If it's good, it's good. <laughs> it's just, that's it. Yeah, so, I'm the... I, I had someone comment on a on a Walmart knife. You know, I went out to uh, lunchtime. I needed a fix. I got a real cheap six dollar knife, and I talked about how I was surprised what you could get for six bucks. Yeah. And someone commented like, "I'm I'm I'm unsubbing. I can't believe you're showing off this crap." And I was like, <laughs> "Look, man, you'll see everything here from a six yeah. dollar knife to as expensive as I can possibly get, and yeah. everything in between." Exactly, and that's what it should be. I mean, that Walmart knife that came out with an access lock. That looked a fantastic knife. Yep. I just couldn't believe it. It's just so. I yep. mean, yes. I, I look. I might not ever carry it. I might not ever use it in real. But I would keep it in my collection just to show what you can get for six bucks. You know, uh, right before we started rolling, uh, I mentioned to you, and I think this is probably a good good place to bring this up because I think you and I are similar in that we have. 
pretty big collections that are show no sign of slowing down. I mean, I, um, it's it's very hard for me to sell knives because if they're in my hand, I'm like, well, this is a great knife. I, uh, uh, but uh, what? How do you evaluate a knife? What are what are the things you're looking for that make it worth buying and worth keeping to you? Bob, I'm going to upset you badly here. I was exactly the same as you. I had hundreds of knives. I don't even know. I never counted them. I had hundreds. About two years ago, I made that leap in. I can't keep all these knives here. Mm -hmm. If I want to get better knives for the channel, I'm on a pension. I don't have a whole lot of I'm comfortable. Don't get me wrong. I'm comfortable. But I don't have that huge amount of money. So two years ago, I started to let go of knives. And it is the most cathartic thing I have ever done in my life it was difficult to get started but you see once i got started and i realized look at the money i just i can i can get this i can get that and i then after i, I got down to where i wanted to i mean i'm under 200 knives now which is amazing from from what i had because i used to get chinese manufacturers sent me six a week you know some of them didn't even make channels but I had boxes because i couldn't give them away so when I started selling, oh, it's such a relief. It's another game. And now I'm now picking the knives that I want, whereas for years I was picking knives for the channel. Hmm. And that is a nice relief. And, yeah, to be honest with you, my uh, my watchers have gone down. <laughs> I get about half as many people now watch my videos than when i done locking knives. Hmm. And I know it doesn't matter in the slightest. The other ones have stayed along, and you see them every now and then. I'm happy with that because I'm happy collecting knives that I like. I want to bring them out. The excitement is genuine. You know, I'm really happy to get them. And locking knives, I have a box here. There's about 15 in it. And I have a couple of scrappy ones lying about the house all over the place and in bags. But I have 15 knives that I just rotate. And each year I buy a new budget knife. And that replaces last year's one. Oh. It's great. It, it gives you another lease of life. And like, expensive one i had to sell an expensive one to get an expensive one so i might not have wanted to let the one go that i did but it just it just makes sense after a while to me to me Bob. Yeah. i mean well it, well no i mean i've I, don't get me wrong i have sold knives but just far fewer than i intend to because <laughs> when i'm away from the collection you know i'm off work or something i'm yeah. like oh i could get rid of that whole bottom drawer and then i go yeah. home open that bottom drawer i'm like yeah but yeah. Mm. yes the finger I... comes up yeah. <laughs> exactly no, I, I, and i get that too bob i get that as well and, and I, again there's no answer you'll do it when you're ready <laughs> it's like so getting let's... married when you find the right one to do it you'll get to it Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know what? I've never regretted uh, getting rid of that zero tolerance Rexford that I thought was so awesome. <laughs> you know, I've never I've never yearned for it since. Yes. So I, uh, I think yeah, I there's a few that I, there's, there's quite a few I could take back quite readily, take them back again. But and, and now that I've got people over here in Northern Ireland, I can sell them to local people who find it harder to get some knives. So that's great. You know, I can pass a bundle off you know, where they'll get a good, really good price for a bundle of knives that they would pay much more to get it delivered from America. Um, okay, so you you posted a video yesterday uh, as we're recording this that, that really, man, I, I didn't even watch it, frankly. I haven't watched it yet, but it got me envious. And not envious, it got me jealous almost immediately. And it was it's all about Great Eastern Cutlery Barlows, of which I have not, I have a, I have a decent, Great Eastern Cutlery Collection, but I have no Barlows. And um, well, you might want yeah. to re-edit that. That wasn't me. That wasn't you. <laughs> no. All right. Well, that was, I, I, um, that was uh, what do you call him? Hmm. Oh, he gets one of the Jack Wolf knives as well. He, he's a um, a jujitsu teacher. Oh, oh, knife thoughts. Right, right. Knife thoughts. He had the all the GC Barlows out. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. My mistake. No, not at all. You said you but, hadn't watched it, so. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. I would have known immediately when I heard his voice. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no no need to edit that out. But but you do have a good number of Great Eastern Cutlery knives. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, I I love Great Eastern Cutlery knives. And you also mentioned Jack Wolf knives. So I, I want to talk about those, too. Um, 
as they as they relate to one another. But first of all, with Great Eastern Cutlery, what is it about those knives in particular that uh, that make you really want to collect them and get more? Everything about them. I, I mean, I've got Jack Wolf knives now that are that are, are really sort of three times the price at least as most of my GECs, you know, and and I love them knives too. But there's something about the GEC, the amount of hand finishing that goes into them. Now, they're not completely handmade anymore, and they're using modern-day machinery. So, I mean, yes, we call them traditional, and they're as traditional as we've sort of got mm. um, with the, the handmade that goes into them. And I love the fact that they're quite hard to get. Now, if you imagine how hard to get over in America, the Ark, imagine what it's like over here. Mm. I invested so much time in my collection of GECs that they become, it's like they become the fabric of your collection. They have to because they're so hard to get. And I, I love bone. I love wood. I love all the, the, the different styles and patterns that comes out of GEC because they are older traditional patterns. Yes, you'll get the modern ones like in everything, but they're taken from older patterns. Yeah. And I just enjoy the older style of knives. I've started buying now old American knives like Shred, Old Timer. I've been getting more case knives. Um, and I'm really enjoying that older class of knife. That, that, that is my passion. The Jack Wolf knives is my modern side of my head. And I, I nearly put them with my locking knives and that modern sort of collection. And it's great because I, I have them separated. Do you know what I mean? I can go with my old traditionals and can sit and stroke them all day long. My chair, I always have a knife to fondle, which is quite sad. But I do. I love sitting with a pocket knife and just fondle. I'm not a flicker. I had a wee period of that, but it just, it really didn't do anything for me. And I cut myself too much. So I love it. You know, there's nothing like getting a, a, a lovely old GEC with a, a beautiful, um, bone on it and sitting at knife time it's like a worry stone this is my worry stone and that's the joy i get out of them and it's the touch and the feel of them and when they when they go discolored after you've cut your steak with them everything about it just i think i went over the top there have i but it is, no no I, it is a passion it really is a passion that's lovely i just everything about it and i don't have to confuse them with higher end ones like Jack Wolf knives. They're right. completely separate. In my head, they're not even the same genre. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, Which I do actually. Well, I think of it the same way. Um, the something about the GECs that I like is that they seem like artifacts. You know, they're made now, oh. but they seem like they seem like they could have come from my grandfather's uh, uh, little little chest on his on his dresser. Um, and then when I look at the Jack Wolf knives, which I positively love um they are modern traditionals i know that's a, a, yeah. a weird thing to say but with the materials and the level of fit and finish and and all of that um they i mean to me they fill a similar they fill a similar need um of a in terms of non-locking knife but and but but the the natural materials of the gecs uh and and the case knives yeah they separate in in my collection as well yeah. What have you found about case knives now that you've started collecting them um, a little bit more? I know that they are um, polarizing. Yeah, they're, I think they're polarizing. <clears throat> and the only reason they're polarizing is that so many people just accept what they get. And I think that's, you know, you've got the diehard case people will, have, will not have anything said bad about case. But I've had a couple that were absolute blooming shockers. Do you know what I mean? They were horrendous. No, I didn't get a stack of them. I've got about 16 GECs, and at the minute I have about, and I've only started on case, I've got about 12, 14 case knives. But every single one of them knives you could give to anybody and say, here, have a look at that. They're well made. Their bone is beautiful. Their dyeing is beautiful. I mean, yes, their blade steels are, are not fantastic, but to be honest with you, and this is where people fall down, a traditional knife does not have the M390. This is a knife that's made for, a, you know, a, was, made, was made for like farm laborers, builders, people who were doing things with their hands. They wanted something that they could cut with, but also when it went blunt, they could get it on a bit of stone in the hearth and give it an edge again. You can't do that with M390, but you can with a, a lesser steel. And that's the other joy of them. They are so easy to keep up. You don't have to be a genius. 
And when you get one of them in spite of course short makers, that's all you'll ever need the rest of your life. You know what I mean? Or the landscape's even cheaper and it works exactly the same. But so, yeah, there's, there's everything about, and it's the history, I think, is the main thing. You think of what we use now, this M390. Go, you know, go back, you know, 100 years. It was a buck 110 or something, you know, with an 8C steel that wasn't hardened the way these modern ones are. I mean, it was just bog standard, you know, steel. And And to be honest with you, if you think that, People crossed America, and that's what they would have had for their food, for making things, repairing things, you know, building structures. I just, that history is the joy of it. Yeah, and and I, I would say that the um, modern marketing machine has, has in my mind, I'm not going to put this on anyone else, but in my mind, it has turned steels that were always fine, always serviceable, always good steels. It's turned yeah. them into butter in my mind. Like, oh my God, if it's not M390 at, <laughs> at 60, uh, it's going to just like, yeah, it'll just bend when I use it. But we forget, yeah. you know, steel is is still steel, even if it's 420. But, but the whole thing about it, Bob, is learning how to sharpen. And I, I'm a, a nagger for people to learn how to sharpen. My friend Justin, who does the podcast with me, couldn't sharpen a knife, and he's now he got himself one of the um, uh, these new super sharpeners. What do you call them? The, the KME or one work sharp. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so I have a workshop here, and I use this for reprofiling. It's um, amazing for reprofiling. You get that first edge that's nice, that you know, it's even all the way up, and then I just hand sharpen after that. Because I never use a knife enough to, go, to get it to go blunt. I, you know, I can't remember the last time I blunted a knife. <laughs> Me too. Unless I uh, <laughs> cut a steak against a plate and yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I do, I do that regular, but I mean, I just hone it and it comes back again because I use carbon steel. So um, my steak knives are beautiful, but they're simple steels that are easy to just bring back again. Um, uh, getting back to the case, I have noticed, uh, and I want to see if you've noticed the same thing, um, straight across the board, all of their models beautiful like you said bone and and natural materials but especially their bone and the way they dye them and the different series they come up with are outstanding but i've always noticed that uh yeah. the cv line you know the chrome vanadium their their 1095 i think they put it, it's much more limited than the stainless steel lines that they have they yeah. have so many different but i have noticed that they put a little extra effort into those cv um, knives and they they seem to be a step above have you noticed yeah. that? Definitely. I, I love their, their CVs normally good. I don't know that it was always 1095. I would have put the, the, the case knives that I've got at maybe 1075. Do you know what I mean? I, I just yeah. wouldn't have put them up that high. They're more like a, the the, st the steels that we've got over here in the UK on our pen knives, um, the older pen knives. But mm -hmm. they've now started to bring out uh, the CV, not the CV, they're bringing it out and they're not calling it CV, but they're calling it 1095. They actually have it on the blade. Oh, okay. So I think it'd be a great one for Pete to do, uh, Cedric and Ada, yeah. to get the old CV and the new one with the 1095 and do a cup test with them. I love Pete's cup tests. I have oh, he's, yeah. And and just him, he himself and he his channel, just, he's, he's awesome. He's a tit. <laughs> uh before um you mentioned a grail knife and i jotted that down because i wanted to come back to it you said you don't you only have one grail what would that be oh. the bench made 940 but what's even more about this this knife was when i first started was i people say it all the time but i would have thought 50 pound to buy you know go on a knife was outrageous you know it was just a, a stupid price but jeff jewel who taught me how to sharpen via you know youtube watching his videos on the phone asking him what i'm doing wrong what i'm doing right and he sent me this and i don't know whether you'll ever remember bob but uh, i danced around my liver living room on a video like a little excited schoolgirl when i got this i was so happy but the first thing that got me was because I'd never seen one over here. I'd never, I didn't know anybody who collected knives. But, but when I came and I opened the box and I looked down into the wee box and I seen this tiny wee knife um, because I'd been so used. I had the Ganzo one that imitated it, 
but it was about an, an inch and a half taller, wider, thicker, it was heavier. And this toady wee thing came out. And it was surprising just how much I went, oh, that's small. <laughs> Well, well, was it was it disappointing or, or oh, was it just a, a, a paradigm not. shift? But do you ever look up something? You look up a knife in a, a late night and you see a knife and it's, oh, that just looks, that's perfect for me. That's my hand size. You order it and it comes and it's about this size. I have done that repeatedly. I never check the sizes of a knife. I really need to do it much more often. I did. Yeah. I um I once got a the my Microtech Troodon out the front double edge. Uh -huh. uh, it's a mini. And when I got it, I, I was so excited that uh, I found a deal. This was uh, on blade forums, you know, secondary market. I was so uh -huh. excited and proud uh, of myself for sleuthing it out and finding a deal. Like no <laughs> one sells a tro down for this. And then when it showed up, it was like, oh, I didn't read it. It's, it's, it's not a combat tro down, you know, and, and hey. actually it's still one of my favorites. Uh, it's, I wouldn't have gotten it if I had known, uh, but you know, I got it. And well, that's a good thing because, um, you know, I, I do get sort of prejudice about size. I like, oh, it's got to yeah, be three and a half to four and that kind of thing. Uh -huh. I got this one this year, which is the small one, the um, 945. I absolutely adore this. I carry this more than I do my 940 now. It's smaller and there was no need to have a smaller 940. It's small enough. But yeah. this, this to me is my swap over from... Uh, these knives to this, this is just, you know, this is smaller than a GEC I would carry, but I just love it because it, it, it's pocket knife size. And I think that's where I'm at now with most of my collecting. It's things that I can just put in my pocket and are comfortable. I don't have to do anything special to carry them or have a super duper clip. I'd rather have something in a slip and in my pocket. But I love the smaller version of the 940, which... You know, I never thought I would ever want a smaller 940. Yeah. So is that how you carry? You just you just drop in a slip and, See, and... it's it's illegal to carry that out in the street because it's got a lock. Yeah. But I, I've got an old man's memory. Sometimes my memory doesn't keep up with the um with the uh, laws. what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I, I just old age do to it. Yeah. Well, I'm getting the gray in my beard too. I'm going to start using that excuse. <laughs> I'm going through gray know. white and <laughs> gray white. Now it's starting to fall out. Um, but I no. had no idea I couldn't carry this, sir. Yeah, well, exactly. And who's going to stop a silly old man sitting in a park carving a stick? I don't do anything that's going to make a knife scary. And if I'm sitting in a park, I'll have a pocket. I'll have that, and I'll have a pocket knife. But that's if I want to break a big twig. I might use that to cut it. You know. But I'll have a pocket knife to sit and whittle with. So, yeah. So it seems like you've uh, you've you've done good missionary work uh, in your community for getting people to like knives, and you've gotten knives in their hands. What about your family? How how what do they think of your knife obsession? They that's exactly what they think it is. I'm obsessed. I spend too much money on it, too much time on it. Is there nothing better I could do? My simple answer is. No, I'm retired. <laughs> I'm, I'm playing unfair. It's, it's, it's my hobby, and I'm sticking to it. So oh, no, no, they're all they all take the mickey out of me. To be honest with you, they can't understand it. My boys um, never had one of them interested in knives. I tried to give them, tried to get them to come in and have a chat with me about nothing. Not interested. And uh, now my grandchildren. I've got two of them that are slightly interested, but the older ones now they're twenty. They joined the navy and they're away. The older grandchildren, they never got interested in knives until they went to join the Navy. Uh, one of them would join the Navy and he wanted a sack to take with him. So I gave him a nice brand new sack there and he's quite happy. But there's no interest. Well, that's a good place to start. Swiss Army knife yeah. is a great place to sp start. You never know. He might return from from the Navy with a with a slightly better understanding of why it's so if important. He uses it. If he uses it, and that is the biggest part of telling, getting somebody into the knife community, you can give them whatever you like. You can give them a $500 knife, but if they don't use it, it stays a $500 knife on a shelf, and they'll never get the love knives. So, I mean, it's getting them using it. It's getting people to tell, look, just carry it in your pocket because you'll find reasons to use them, and that's when they become useful. Well, See, I, it was a I, flashlight. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Are you a flashlight guy? Are you a, a? Yeah, I have a 
about 10 maybe of flashlights, but that's going back six years, which is a lot of them I gave away because companies send you them to review until I got completely bored with flashlights. I only need 100 lumens for anything, yeah. <laughs> you know, but... Uh, well, this, this is this is where um, it becomes or I become irrational because um, I like to uh, well, I'm going to use an expression from your side of the, the pond, but I like to take the piss out of people on Thursday Night Knives about torches. You know, it's not it's not a movie. It's a film. It's not yeah. a flashlight. It's a torch. And <laughs> I'm like, what do you need that for? I what are you more than 100 lumens. And then they'll come back and say, well, why do you need 20 Bowie knives? And I'm like, well. <laughs> it is. It's another part of that EDC side seems to be coming so popular now. Yeah. These fidget things that uh, Lefty has. <laughs> yeah, I gave things like that to my children when they were in a pram. <laughs> I don't get them. <laughs> yeah, hello. Yeah. I'll have to say I still have one spinner that uh, I got from uh, a company years ago it was a titanium one and i still sometimes get it out when i'm sitting at the desk and give it a wee twirl i got it i got to give it to lefty he really did resurrect the fidget oh. thing you know because uh, i i thought i thought it you know came and died a quick death pretty much but but he he persists and he gets he finds some pretty exotic ones look i think lefty is one of the best newcomer youtubers because he doesn't take himself seriously he has he has put in effort to get them knives and making a great job of it. But he's now selling underpants. He's now, he is actually doing underpants on yeah, his yeah. channel. He's, yeah, he can sell stone. To me, he's the the perfect YouTuber. If you want to sit back and just watch somebody, you know, it's like a, a, a Duracell battery. You wind him up and he goes to the next thing, gives it 100% and then moves on to the next thing. He's fantastic. He's one of the few guys I can listen to and don't even have to watch. Yeah. You know, yeah, he's, I, I exactly. Like, uh, uh, so the the whole um, EDC thing, you know, um, I guess um, knife adjacent gear that's uh, collectible. You know, we were talking uh, about case knives; they're imminently collectible because they keep mm. giving you the same but different, the same but different. Yeah. Um, how are you on this EDC thing? Um, you know, besides flashlight, which is kind of a necessity, a lighter yeah. or something to make fire at some point. Yeah. Not knives, of course. But how do you feel about the whole EDC thing? I, like, I'm going to be really honest. I think I'm just a bit too old for it. Uh, what goes into my pockets has been going into my pockets for years. Mm. And the thought of adding something else in just my treasures will fall off if I keep putting things in them. You know what I mean? I, I need bra braces. Well, I actually, this is an interesting point because uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit older than a lot of the EDC guys yeah. on YouTube, and it's a similar thing. I think it's good for young, um, and I'm going to say, well, men and women. It's good for uh -huh. young men and women because they're growing up now in a time where um, self reliance is not pushed yeah. so much. Yeah, and they're looking at, the, it, you know, yeah. everything happens virtually. And so the more prepared physically in the real world or excited you can get people about that, the better. When I was growing up, you know, it was kind of like uh, that was a given. We, we didn't have all that yeah. stuff. And I know I sound like an old guy now. We didn't have all those things. But, <laughs> you know, so so what was exciting were gadgets, uh, yeah, mechanical it, it, gadgets. It is just the genuine truth that when we grew up, we were out in the forest, we were building forts, we were playing cowboys and Indians, and you had to make your own bows. You didn't go to the shop and mommy bought you one because he, they did, we didn't have the money for that. So you went and you made them. My dad taught me how to make bow and arrows. Um, so there was the sort of things that you got used to having things that were useful, as, as you rightly said. And a knife was always the first one you wanted. Um, you have done quite a bit of, if I'm not mistaken, um, mistaken, I mean, um, uh, what do you call it? Caravanning? Yeah, well, yeah. I've, I had a motorhome for years, okay. um, and then we now got a static. But I used to bushcraft as well. I camped an awful lot by myself because my kids didn't like that either. So mm -hmm. I used to go by myself up to the woods, spend a night up there or two nights, and, and just have a fire, build something, uh, like a, a chair, and then sit down in the hammock, cook my dinner, and videoed it. It was very straight. I was very basic with videos. It was just turn it on. Here's what it is. But I enjoyed that. Again, it's that thing of getting out and doing something that just takes your mind away from everyday life. Um, and when I got knives, 
I was getting to that age where I had to stop doing it. I was getting into Amok, and I was nearly going to have to ring the wife up to come and get me out of it again. <laughs> so it's just, but I loved all that. I, I, I suppose I do like um, even sports. My last lot of sports was golf and things like that. It was very one side. It was just you against whatever, and I quite like that. I played rugby all my young life, mm-hmm. um, so it was nice to get away from that gang mentality to just be able to be comfortable with myself. I mean, there was times in my life I couldn't sit in a room by myself without feeling anxious or, or the, the thoughts, bad thought would come back. Knives is that other side of this that we don't like to talk about, but it's just so true. It gives me, I can go in and sit in a room for eight hours and not miss a single soul and be very, very happy. I don't get to do that very often, but I knew I could. Yeah, I, I think that's ultimately what, uh, the hobbies are about. I remember my grandfather, um, you know, who, who all of the, we, I come from a very artistic family and it all comes through my, my paternal, my maternal grandfather. And I remember being young and kind of sitting down and drawing for like maybe 10 minutes and then getting up and running around. And, and I remember him saying, you're going to need to, uh, kind of, basically hunker down on the hobby bobby you need a hobby i remember him saying i'm like yeah. i got hobbies i like to draw he's like you can't sit still for more than five minutes you need a hobby and and only as i get older do i realize how true that is he used to say uh because he loved to fish he'd say a fisherman never gets in trouble you know the idea <laughs> being you always have something to do if yeah. you if if your hands are idle, you can always go fishing. And in this case, it's if your hands are idle, you can always make a knife video. You know, so I mean, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say that was another one of my sports fly fishing that took up later on in life, oh, yeah. and I loved it. Uh, I loved getting in the rivers and catching wee half pound brownies up and down a river all day, sitting watching the, the birds. The, it was just. Again, it was that something that took me away. And I think every man, probably especially because a woman seemed to be able to just decompart or decompartmentalize everything. I'll do this then, I'll do that then. I don't have that ability. I have a head that's all over the place. So when I'm doing a sport or I'm doing a hobby, that it gets all my attention and makes me sit, uh, sit and do it. Yeah, you're right about that. Uh, I mean, I don't know if I can say that straight across the board about all no, women, but. but- but but all the women I know and work for and with, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like um, I, I've been told that I clean the house impressionistically a little bit here now, a little bit over there, yeah. a little bit over there. <laughs> Eventually it all gets done. But, I, you know, going room to room seems to be a difficult thing. <laughs> That's funny. I was hoovering today, Bob. And I get the hoover right now. I was doing the hoover. And it wasn't working. And I'm going, Sally, the hoover's not working right. It's not picking up. And I'm keeping on going. Come do you see this. And my wife comes in with that look on her face. Stephen, you're 64 year old. Is it full up? Is there something wrong with it that way? Check it. Oh, I've never done that. <laughs> <laughs> so she just grabs it, takes it away, fixes it, and give it back to me. And I'm happy then with the Hoover. Yeah, yeah. Look at the lines. They're all so yeah. straight, you know. And then I get we shout, Did you move the puffy? <laughs> no. <laughs> the move the what? The puffy. Uh footstool. Oh. We call oh, it a okay. puffy. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the, okay. So I know you've been <clears throat> making the videos. I want to talk about the podcast that you do, but, uh, but, but first, how do you determine, like, do you make videos on any sort of schedule or how do you determine when and what you're going to do? Is it just kind of like what, uh, grabs your attention, what you're most excited about at the time? It's usually when I walk in here, like I, I always used to say my Saturday chats was I come in the Saturday, I would get a stack of knives out and I would just sit and look at them and then try to pick topics that I might use during the week. But I'd do one on Saturday, just a, a chat on something that I'd picked up on while I was having a look at them. But during the week, I just get up in the morning, I'll have my breakfast, I sit, I'll do whatever we chores Sally has for me. And then I just pop into the room and whatever I pick out, sometimes I can have 50 knives out on the table and not find anything that's come into my head about making a video. Because like you know, after six years of doing this, mm. I, I've done quite a lot of videos. I'm trying to think of something that's new is impossible anymore. I just, I can't do it. I don't have that reach. So I just pick a couple of knives out, then I'll get maybe a comparison with, and you just sit there and it comes to your head and you do it. 
I, I don't script anything. And all that's because I'm rubbish at photography. I can't take it in. Um, I've never played a video game in my life. I don't, I, don't, I don't have anything in common with these people that can flick everywhere. And my podcast is only working because I've got Justin now who knows what he's doing. Much like your Jim, he is yeah. my Robinson Crusoe, and he even talks as well, which saves me something else. So um, he's on big wages, mind you. Uh, yeah, you got you. You're paying him big for this. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> nothing. <laughs> yeah, that that whole concept of geez, what am I going to talk about this time yeah. uh, with knives? But you know what I've noticed is that uh, well, first of all, um, I'm always surprised that I do come up with something. Um, yeah. Because, uh, it because it's not a static thing. Like you said, you you're always you know every time you walk into the room, you're reengaging, so to speak, with the knives, and things do pop up. But you know what else is great is this thriving community also gives you ideas. Um, yeah, uh, I'm surprised at the by people who put out videos every single day. Uh, you know, like tabletop full length tabletop videos every single day. And they come up with something new, something new. Uh, some of these, some of our favorite voices have, uh, you know, that's their living. You know, not too many, yeah. but so you know, they have to come up with stuff. And I'm, I'm yeah. shocked at the creativity. Yeah, absolutely, it's not something I would never want this to be my living because it's so important to me as a hobby. Mm. Um, I mean, Bob, and most of my, I never even ask for subscribers anymore. I don't, I, I didn't really all the time, but I don't ask. If I've got people that are watching my videos, I'm happy. And, you know, I've, over the years, I used to be getting higher numbers, maybe twice as high as I'm getting now. And it doesn't bother me because I have enough friends in the community now that I talk to and that watch my videos. It makes it worthwhile for me. So, I mean, I don't think I'll change. I think I'm too old to change. I'm not a very good reviewer anyway. At the best of time, I just throw a knife on the table and talk what I think of it. That's all it is. Uh, and I, 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 another wee fella just started up from the UK yesterday and I was able to help him get started and give him a few tips and see the joy in doing that and getting people in the UK. The more I think you get involved, the more it's going to become, um, the more other people are going to see it and realise that it's nonsense making this silly decision on knives just based on what the government tell you. Oh, I could not agree with you more on that. And then, in, you know, in terms of numbers and your numbers fluctuating or whatever, yeah. and then settling in once you've settled in, I think that that's um, indicative of this. Uh, I think people tune in because they like, for instance, you, not necessarily even your knives or what you're going to say. Yeah. That That's what drew them in. You know, oh, he talks GECs a lot. I love that. And, and I like that he shows them up close. But eventually, um, you know, you tune in to someone like you or me because they like you or me uh for instance yeah. cutlery lover uh who's been on the air longer than anyone almost Watched him for years i love him and he's just such yeah. a cool dude and he could talk about hot sauce and i'll watch it he can talk about <laughs> weight loss i'll watch it yeah i just like him yeah he went a bit mad last year on silver coins he had me distracted <laughs> on silver <laughs> and coins yeah. <laughs> that I switched off on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, uh, he's got a lot for everyone, but it's it's really his his personality eventually, exactly. and his voice. You get used to someone's voice, and it's nice to hear, you know. And, and Bob, your personality, I think, sort of reflects your knife collection too. Um, I'm an old, you know, I'm an older person, but my 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 love, my proper love, is older knives. Now, geez, you're not older, they're brand new, but they're that older style of knife. Right. And I mean, I would never go out with a seven inch fixed blade on the side, even if it was legal. You know, I just wouldn't do that because it, it's it's never been in my psyche. So, you know, I don't need to wish for it. Whereas other people, you know, young people would, would love to be able to do it. It's not something. So I've sort of come down in size and I've sort of come down in expectations you know what i mean of what other people want to see i just do what i do and i have enough people that like what i'm doing and it's marvelous it really is I, see once I, I we put an awful lot of pressure on ourselves when we first come around oh, i must be good i must do this what am i doing that he's not doing trying to copy that and that's right that's how you get on in anything you you copy take what you like put it back out if you don't like it try something new but i think once you get past that stage like you're the most comfortable person I know behind the microphone in the whole of YouTube community. 
<laughs> you have now, you know, it, it, you sit back and it's like, oh, under your shirt, sit back, Bob's on. You you have that personality that just, you want to listen to you talk and it's effortless. It looks as if you're not putting any work in it, but I know you're putting work in it. And I know Jim's putting work in it, but for the person who's sitting in front of you, who you're trying to engage with, it's just, oh, there's Bob. He's a good laugh. I go on his channel. I'll get my name read out. I can give what my carry is. And for people who don't have YouTube channels, that's a big thing, getting their name called out, getting their daily carry called out. I think that's something that's maybe neglected by a lot of us, where you hit on that. And now everybody's doing it. What are you carrying with? But I think you were the one that initially really started that off. And you got people coming to you because they got that where they never got it on another channel. So I it just... And I, I know I'm, a, I'm the worst in the world at the minute. I, I go and watch videos. I forget to subscribe. I forget <laughs> to do comments because in the nighttime, I'll maybe watch 15. And I'm trying to get them all watched before I go to bed. And I say, I'll definitely go back and do that. Never do it. No, no, no. There are too many, so many videos. Yeah. I've got so many people that I know in the community that I watch their videos. If I was to start answering every question, and I would never get to bed at night at all. And I'm a bad sleeper as it is. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, you and uh, you and Jim, I think, have got a, a fantastic. I'm, I'm getting that feeling with Justin, although we're very much ad hoc, but you see the bouncing off each other and the, oh, yeah. the crack that we have while we're doing it. That's worth, oh, money couldn't buy that. So what are you learning from the that end of it? You know, it's different. It's conversational as opposed to you just waxing uh, poetic alone in a room. Yeah. What are you getting out of the podcast? Um. Again, I'm meeting, I met somebody who I hadn't met, but I've known for six years on YouTube. He's commented on my videos for six years. I've met him when we talk, we text and all. Um, but he came on my podcast, Tony Medor. I don't know whether you know him, do you? Oh, yeah, yes. I, I know, yes. His collection now is very, very high-end knives. We had him on the po podcast last week, and he says, well, what should I bring on? He'd never been on a podcast, never been on YouTube. And I says, I want the most expensive, luscious looking knives that you have. Bring them on and let me see them. Because if I want to see them, other people are going to want to see them. And like, I can see, you know, 500 Civivis. I'll still not get excited. I just won't. But he came on last week. And if you get a chance, go back and watch it. He was a gent to talk to. You'd swore he'd done it all his life. Um, and he has some of the most beautiful you know, $3,000 knives sitting there with all the bells and whistles. I would be frightened to take it out of the box. But that's me. He's not. He loves it. It's what he, he's in retirement too. He's got a bit more money he ever had. So he can just invest in them. And they are just so lovely to watch and see what other people like. I, I, I have never had knife envy. I've knives that I've wanted that other people had, but I've never been envious of them. Yeah, if that yeah. makes any sense. Oh yeah, sure. You know, that's yeah. why I said jealous and not envious before. Envious yeah. means I want it and I don't want you to have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm quite happy. But I mean, Wait. yeah, go ahead. I'm Bob. sorry. You said $3,000 knife. You show is, is that like a fixed blade art knife? No, or this is, this is a folding knife. Oh, man. And there was, there was numerous of them. He, he brought about six knives out. And they were all over a thousand, but some of them were way over. You should go and have a look. So that just I will. They're like a piece of art. You're an artist. And when you see a knife like that, you have to look at it artistically. Not how much it costs, not what you know, you think that's crazy. It's a piece of art. And the workmanship that goes into some of them knives is truly astounding. And then you get to talk to somebody you like that who's got them. And I was saying to him, how long does it take these boys to make these knives? And he says, do you want to know something? Some of them can make a whole one on a day. <laughs> and others, it takes months to make one, you know, to get it. And I just, I love finding that sort of thing out, that somebody has the ability to do something like that in one day. When you see them, you'll understand why. It's just. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm getting an awful lot. Of, and, and we're going to meet more and more people. And we're going to do it from something. I'm going to get this. We fellas just started. He's in his second video, second day. I'll get him on in a week's time. There's a lovely person to start. What do you want to get out of it? You know, he already collects knives, but um, it'll be nice to see what he's looking for. Oh, yeah. And 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 that's a little boost. You know, that's also yeah. getting him, you yeah. know, kind of, it's like throwing the kid in the pool. Okay, now you can swim. That's great. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, uh, I, and I got an awful lot of help when I came around. So, I mean, see if you can give a tiny wee bit back to that, of what I got, I got far too much, but uh, it really set me on my way. Now, do you ever have the urge or desire to make knives yourself? Are you a tinkerer or a handy guy? No, not whatsoever. It's never, never. I would love to design, I'm saying design one. I, I will get one done by Ashley Harrison over here, who's, um, uh, is my favorite um, knife maker, but it, it's a he's the son. Him and his father own Arthur Wright knives. Oh, okay. And actually makes customs on the side. Not not only running a factory, but he makes these in his spare time. Um, and I I've got numerous knives off him. He's a custom maker, but these are knives that are traditionally made by hand. He does the whole lot from start to finish. Um. And he, and he makes them in the, the more simple materials. It's, you know, ten uh, C70, you've got 1095, 01 tool steel. All his custom ones are in 01 tool steel. Mm -hmm. But it's not hardened to its highest ability because it's meant to be a work knife, even though it's a custom. Now, if you'd ask him, he'd maybe go and get you that certain steel, but that's not him. So I just let him pick the steel that he thinks appropriate. Again, Bob, I'm probably never going to blunt it. Yeah. But he has made me some beautiful, my favorite working knife um, was a knife that cost about, you know, it would cost about 120, 130 pounds handmade just for me. This is the only one. <laughs> oh, Look my that. goodness. That is just beautiful. That is beautiful. All handmade. Is that camel bone? What is that? What kind no, of bone? No, that is just ordinary bone dyed, just white bone dyed. That is beautiful. It's beautiful. Look at that shield. It, it just everything. And it's a heavy knife because it's thick bits of bone. It's a heavy knife. It's got a good spine. On. It's a working knife. And that's what his Arthur Wright and I, they're, they're never going to be the best fit and finish in the world because they make too many too quickly. And it's for work. It's for farmers. They're all in farmer shops. You know, you'll get them. They're not just farmers, but, you know, working men, they go in, they buy a cheap knife. It's, you know, 25, 30 quid. They buy it, they use it, they blunt it, throw it away, get another one the next time they're in there. But this is one of my favorite work knives ever. Arthur what? Give me that name again. Arthur Wright and Son. They're a, an old English company. Arthur Wright and Son. Okay. Um, I Because when you first mentioned it, I said, oh, yeah, yeah. But then I was thinking, of, I, I think I was misremembering because you've uh, featured a number of uh, uh knife uh folders from great britain uh that ah. that are not that i am not so familiar with and that maybe are not so common over here there's another one that's made by him mm. Mm. look mm. at that is that not beautiful and these that are two fully you'll not see any joins or anything in the um in the shell at all it is absolutely perfection and watch this back spring you'll like this bob Ooh. look at that oh. If it's, you're only listening, there is beautiful file work on this uh, slip joint spring on the back. There's file work on the brass uh, liners, but then up the center on the spine of the knife, I don't know if you can see that. It's like a, you know, a holly leaf sort of going up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I like a leaf. See. That is done by his father. It's chased with a hammer and chisel. He does it freehand right up the back of the spine. Unbelievable. It is so beautiful. If you can see that right up the center, that's all done by hand. And there's wow. not, I can't see a flaw anywhere. It's beautiful. So, so this is obviously you, one of the custom ones. Yeah, this is, yeah. yeah. But I'd asked, I'd asked Ashley, that I knew his father had done this. And he does it on one of the, I think the Senator knife. He does it for the company. But I asked him, would he do this especially just for me on the knife Ashley was making me? And he done it. So I was over the moon to get the father and son um, together. So being in Northern Ireland, uh, have you um, have you formed special relationships with any of uh, any of the makers uh, in Great Britain that 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 has yielded anything in terms of like, um, well, I mean, have you have you because you're, we don't see too many YouTubers, too many big no. uh, reviewers from over there. No, okay. no. It's well, no, I've made a, a with Ashley. I'm very close with a couple of shops, especially a shop now that sells um the Jack Wolf knives over here. I've made a great relationship with the father and son that own it. Um, and I'm hopefully going over to England next this year, the end of this summer, to visit. They've invited me to the factory, me and Justin, to go over and get a factory tour 
which I would just love to, because this is a, an old factory with old machinery. It would just be a, an absolute dream of mine to get lost in it. So yeah. that would be nice. But there's not a lot of knife makers that make slip joints in the UK. There's lots that make fixed blade and bush, bushcraft's a big thing over here, which what I was into first of all, which again involves a very important knife, but it's not so important that it has to cost 500 pounds. My Mora lasted me for 15 years. So, oh, again, the sad know. mathematics of knives. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I had a Mora and I had an open L. The Mora done all my woodwork. The open L done my cooking and fancy stuff. And that was it. And I had a... Well, <laughs> I was so different. I had an old cleaver from my kitchen, which I still use to this day for chopping firewood. Oh, cool. <laughs> one of the best knives ever. It was a heavy, big cleaver. It was great for delimbing branches and doing whatever. I never had a posh hatchet. So, See, that's what's cool. That That is a very frontier attitude, you know? I'm going to take yeah. this cleaver. I'm going to butcher my meat with it. Then I'm going to chop down this tree. Then I'm going to make kindling. I Don't love it. Anything. My wife still doesn't know it's hers. Oh, <laughs> we'll keep it under that. I know she's one of the Knife Junkie podcast biggest fans, so I'll keep it. It, under. it. it was it was one of the good ones I took out of the kitchen. I don't know what happened to it, darling. I have no idea. <laughs> All right, uh, Patty. As as we do uh, when we're wrapping up a show with a, a reviewer, someone such as yourself who has a channel, I like to do a speed round. Uh, so I could really, you know, get the cut of your jib just from <laughs> one answer uh, questions here. So are you ready, sir? Go ahead, man. I'm ready. Okay. And 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 if you've been enjoying this conversation, which to me has flown by and you I no doubt believe. are, please be sure to maybe check us out on Patreon because there will be more conversation with Patty uh, up on Patreon. And uh, so that's my incentive to tell you to go over there and, and check it out. <laughs> oh, um, I've got but, some gossip, Bob, as well. What's that? Oh, wild gossip. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Become I can't Patreon wait to hear that stuff. <laughs> Become a Patreon member. I didn't think Lefty could do that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can't <laughs> wait to hear this hot take. <laughs> All right. Uh, so first, fixed or folder? Folder. Okay. Traditional or modern? Traditional. Half stop or no half stop? Mostly half stop. Okay. Flush at half stop or doesn't matter? Couldn't give a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> clip point or spear point? Oh, flip. Oh, that's a terrible question. You have done some work in it. Um, <laughs> I have to pick one. Yeah. I'll go for the aesthetic day clip point. Okay. Multi bladed or single bladed? Single bladed. High carbon or stainless? High carbon. Light pull or heavy pull? Heavy pull. Modern, ma modern materials or traditional materials? Traditional. Okay, lanyard hole or not? Don't really matter. Okay. Um, not probably then, yeah, probably not. Not. Yeah, you don't see it too much on traditionals, but the back no. pocket and the, some some models I do like it on. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, have a, I have a couple I like it on, you know, especially the GECs. I like a, a lanyard on my big GECs. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, GEC or Jack Wolf knives? No, I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry, it'll have to be GEC. That is my, you know, it, it is. Uh, GEC would be it, yeah. Okay, one one more of this style question. Case knives or Rough Rider? Kiss. <laughs> you can explain that. that quite enough. <laughs> <laughs> Jigged bone or smooth bone? Jigged bone. Okay. Micarta or carbon fiber? Ah, that, that's difficult because in Micarta, I'm going to say um, carbon fiber because I don't have many of, of either on traditional knives. So I'm going to go to my other higher end knives. Would be, yeah, I would definitely go um, carbon fiber. Carbon fiber. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Second to last question, form or function? Um, it should be function, but to be honest with you, form sometimes gives it good. So. Welcome to the club, sir. Yeah. And then lastly, what is your desert island knife? And all I mean by that is you have to get rid of everything else but keep one knife. What would that be? Tinder or slippy. And I know it's not a locking knife, but I don't care. It, it's the knife that I would take and feel comfortable using anywhere. And it's a, it's just a beautiful knife. I have always wanted to get my hands on one of those. And, and I, it's unexpected and great to hear you say that. Yeah, look, honestly, Bob, I've never seen a knife that's been designed for a anybody who's scared. If I hold down here, I can still get four fingers, right? I close the knife. It can't get me. If I go up to the choil, it can't close at all. Yeah. So it's the most safe slip joint that Hinderer spent so much time getting that right because to close it there is nearly unheard of and it doesn't hit you. Look at that gap. That yeah. was somebody who took a lot of time making a knife right, and I love this knife. It's thin enough that you can use it for food prep and thick enough that you can use it for everything else. So there we go. Oh, man. Now... I don't like you because you just put in my mind that I have to get one of those. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what, they have the prices dropped out of them at the minute. I would get one now. I've oh, yeah. seen them go on, I've seen them go on 200 pounds on the secondary market. Wow, okay. And that cost me 300 a few years ago. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to check that out because I love my hinderer knives and yeah, uh, I, I, like need, it, I need a slip joint companion. Patty, Stephen, I want to thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It has been a long time coming and I'm so yeah, glad we finally you. made this happen. And I would love to see you on my podcast now that you're on camera. We'll definitely get that made. I would love to see it. And the one thing I'm going to ask you to bring with you is six knives that you would treasure as in your fighting knives. That, oh. Because a lot of people don't see them. I would love to hear. I've heard you talk about them and the passion that's in you. So that would be great if you do that. Sorry. Oh, man. I on. would I would love that opportunity. That yeah, sounds definitely. not only to be on your show, but to show off those knives uh, yeah. on your show. That'd be that'd be so awesome. Amazing. All right, Patty. Thank you, sir. I'll check Thank in with you, you in sir. a minute. All right. Thanks, Take everybody, care. for watching. Subscribe. <laughs> There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Stephen of Patty's Potato Peelers. Talk about someone who's easy to talk to, man. I feel like uh, I've known him for years, and uh, I can't wait to go on his podcast now. Uh, so I'll, when that happens, you better believe I'm going to broadcast that far and wide here, so you'll find out when that is. Be sure to join us next week for another great conversation, and of course, Wednesday for the Midweek Supplemental, and then Thursday, Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on YouTube, also on Facebook and Twitch. Not that I've ever video gamed. For Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.